New record net migration figures have provoked anger among some Conservatives because of the failure to deliver on a key manifesto pledge from the 2019 election. There's also frustration from those outside the party who campaigned for Britain to leave the EU. Among them, Nigel Farage, former leader of the Brexit party UKIP and now a presenter on GB News. He's conceded that Brexit has failed. So where did it all go wrong? And did he and other politicians overpromise on the benefits? Nigel Farage, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Now, you are the most famous advocate of Brexit, perhaps vying with Boris Johnson. And you recently made a stark admission that Brexit had failed. Do you want to apologise to voters for telling them that we should leave the EU if it was a failure? Well, let's finish the sentence. Brexit has failed under the Tories. Yes, I mean, look, in constitutional terms, Brexit is a success. We've left the European Union, we've reversed the status quo, and the reason we won the referendum, the reason the turnout was 10% higher than all the analysts thought it was going to be, was this idea that the population explosion in Britain caused by immigration was diminishing people's quality of life. And, and frankly, that is completely down to this government setting the level at which people can come for work permits, basically at the level of minimum wage. Regulation, immigration, do you take any responsibility for some of the failures of Brexit or some of the promises that were made in the campaign that were not realised? Any responsibility at all? Absolutely none. No, absolutely none. I was very, very clear, very, very clear, this was about reducing numbers, it was about moving to an Australian-style point system where you set the barriers and you set the levels so that you get genuinely skilled migration. And willfully, Boris Johnson willfully lowered those salary levels. And we've also seen this explosion of foreign students coming to Britain being allowed to bring dependents. But the thing is, when people think of Brexit, they do think of you and Boris Johnson. They of course. do. Of course. And you made lots of promises as well in that campaign. Uh, not really, no. No, no, I, I was the one making the least number of promises. And... You said in June 2016 that um, you could get net migration to under 50,000. Well, of course, but I wasn't in charge. Look, you know, had we been a European country with proportional representation, you know, I would have been in a position of authority to work with government to try and achieve this. As it is, the irony was... Here's the irony. The day after the referendum, the very, very people I'd fought against for 25 years were still in power. And so what you've got, and even in 2019, you've got a government that was given an 80-seat okay. majority, but here's the key, they never really believed in it. OK. Well, look, you also made the promises to the British people about controlling borders, laws, having trade deals. That US trade deal is nowhere to be seen. None wonder, of it happened. No, I wonder why that is. I wonder why that well, is. Does, I wonder why but, that is. But I'll tell does you why this that is. make... My question actually was... Does this make the public more cynical about politicians like you that promise these things that don't... I can, do, do you reflect on that? I can promise you. If you look at the polling this week, done by YouGov... I've got it here. ..Brexiteers that are disappointed, and I'm one of them, you know, I'm in that number. 37% of Brexit voters are disappointed. Of that 37%, 75% lay it firmly and squarely at the door of this government. Let me put it... Another way, then, do you think the public might think twice about believing what you say next time? No. No, but they might think twice about what the Conservatives say next time. And, so, I, and I think, you know, I think a lot of this is down to a breach of trust between what is being promised to voters at elections and what's being delivered. And what would be your solution in the short term? Would you close off the borders and have worker shortages in the UK to, in order to drive net migration down. If that meant, if that meant there was a realistic chance of people finding somewhere to live, a school for their kids to go to that was local, people getting access to the National Health Service, then yes, of course. So you would, you would shut the borders... I didn't say shut the well, borders. Well, you would, you would you reduce do? the number of workers, even of course, if that meant of course, shortages of, course, of fruit pickers. Of course, pickers. Of course. You, would, okay. you, you cannot go on. Look, before 2004, when this really kicked off, right, cabbages were not rotting in the fields of Lincolnshire. Elderly people were not being left alone in old people's homes. We managed to do all of this, and we've now become addicted 
to cheap, unskilled foreign imported labour. We have to reverse that process. Well, let's talk about the execution, because it seems to me that a lot of people see you as the biggest cheerleader of Brexit. It hasn't worked out in the way... No. ..that perhaps was promised to the British people. It hasn't worked out in the way... It there hasn't, is deep It hasn't regret. worked out in the way that I spent nearly 30 years campaigning so, for. But, but you won't take responsibility for that. I wasn't given say, the I power. I, I wasn't given the power. So that it's not on me, Gov, right? No, 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 let, no. I wasn't in a position of so, authority. So let's talk about the execution, because let's try to get to the truth of this. I think it's fascinating about how it could have gone better, right? Because you think, don't you, that there was another way that Brexit could have worked for Britain. And it seems to me that your model would have been decisive political decision for the country to diverge from the EU, slash taxes, reduce regulation, build a Singapore on Thames. That, that's what you wanted, I never, I know, I never quoted a Singapore on Thames, but I tell you what I do think. I think so much of what we do as a government and what the European Union does as well is to meet the demands and needs of the lobby groups for giant companies. There's a sector of our economy that has been left out of this debate completely. Self-employed, small traders, those businesses, they were the ones that voted Brexit. They were the ones that wanted an easing, a lifting of the burdens. And actually, it's from those millions of people that you get genuine economic growth. That, that's uh, what and you, that's been forgotten. That, that's, at, at the moment, it seems that we're in the worst of all worlds because we haven't taken the Brexit opportunities, perhaps, that, that you visited. But, but that did involve massive diversions, deregulation, mm. slashing taxes, trying to make the UK economically competitive it didn't and involve, it, No, we didn't need to slash taxes. Remember, actually, one of the few things that George Osborne got right is we did bring corporation tax down to a reasonable and competitive level. We've now gone... We, we, we've now converged with France with our corporation tax rates. And you know one of the worst things of all that's happened, and this is not being spoken so about So you did enough. want to cut corporation tax? No, 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 I want to leave it where it was. We had a competitive corporation tax rate. Well, we don't with we'd, Ireland. We'd all, no, Ireland even more competitive and good for them, all right? But, but the, the short-term necessities were not slashing taxes post-Brexit. The short-term necessities were, number one, decisive political action, triggering Article 50 the day after the referendum. Had that been done, the trade deal with America would have been concluded. But because the Conservative Party... Yes, of course, there were some that campaigned for Brexit, but the party itself hated the Brexit result. We've had years of hesitancy, and even when they seemed to finally get the message, they didn't get it. They've never, ever, as a party, have believed in this. But, th but this... So what... The po it seems to me that your vision of a post-Brexit Britain was almost the vision that Liz Truss had, a completely... Uh, more uh, driving the economy, deregulating, cutting taxes, trying to compete with the EU trade Helping box, the right? little people. That was my agenda, helping the little people. I always fought for that, I always stood for that, and it has not happened. I guess what I'm asking you, what I'm trying to get to, is whether the project was sold to the British people in a way that wasn't going to come to fruition and the actual real project was what I'm talking to you about, well, the only way it would have worked. Well, well, I, look, I do think... And you didn't really talk to the British people about how it was going to work. I talked to the British people about achieving independence, all right? And, and, and there were two areas, and I repeat this, there were two areas that I thought were easily deliverable. The first was reducing this massive population increase into our country, and the second was to lift some of the burdens off the backs of ordinary men and women going out there trying to earn a living. They were the two... two uh, and, and you know something? They were realistic expectations of those that voted Brexit, and they haven't happened. And, I mean, frankly, frankly, I look at that... But you, but... I, I look at that 2019 Tory manifesto, the way it was put to the people, and, frankly, it was a big lie. Isn't partly the truth of net migration, that for economic growth, you need a level of net migration. Oh, we, listen, I've been hearing this for a quarter of a century, all right? You know, you know, if increasing the British population by 8 million people has added, you know, a few pips here and there, a few decimal points here and there to GDP, so blooming what? There is something that is far more important than the size of our GDP. There is something actually called community. There is something called quality of life in this country. And these are things... Do you know, these are things that virtually nobody in Westminster even talks about, but they are very keenly felt, 
outside the M25. But you made it sound so simple in that referendum campaign, and it wasn't simple, was it? It was never going to be simple. Yeah, it, it, you, what, you well, what made you do, it look like it was going to be a simple thing to do. Well, what you do... And it was never going to be simple. On the morning of the 24th of June, 2016, you trigger Article 50, you begin the process. No-one's saying it was going to be simple, but we made it very, very difficult because we had a government full of Remainers who didn't believe in it. And I am... I mean, to be honest with you, there's nobody more disappointed than me in what this government's done. I'm furious. I would have loved to have been in a position of responsibility, but I wasn't. But you promised things as well in that referendum that you could never deliver. I think you'll find Boris Johnson and others were the ones but making you, promises. You, 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 right? you said you could get... I, I, I was looking to ask yeah. from June before the vote, June mm. 2016, you said we can get net migration down to 50,000 Yes, people. of course. Now, whether you want yes, to blame Boris Johnson or Rishi... No, 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 of course people we People will can. look at that and say, yeah, this, I believe this guy. Yes. I believe this yes. guy. Yes, of course. I voted for it because of this guy. We could have got it down to 50,000. And this guy let me down. No, no, this guy didn't no, no, tell me no, no, the no. truth. I wasn't... If, if, you put, if, if they put me in charge of it, we'd have got to 50,000 a year. No question about it, but they didn't. And so the problem we've got now is, I, I, you know, I said Brexit, I said 10 years ago, I wanted to cause an earthquake in British politics, all right? Well, we got the earthquake. We're still suffering the aftershocks And now of it. we're all living with the fractures of it. Well, we're it. suffering the aftershocks because... And we've even got though, migration at 606,000. Yes, yes, because Parliament and the government have ignored the will of the people. They've ignored what was said in that Brexit referendum. And so now a bigger question emerges as to how we're going to change politics in this Do country. Do you ever look at it, though, and think... Uh, I, I promised things to the British people that I, as a politician, didn't know if I could deliver. I feel some responsibility no, because for they it were, going wrong. No, because they were all... Never your fault. They were all, no, they were all deliverable. That's the point. It wasn't difficult to do. But that's the point. I mean, maybe they weren't as deliverable as you made out them to, as them to be. For example, with net migration, I'm maybe sorry, it sorry. wasn't as simple as Do you as think that. if I'd been in charge, we'd have allowed foreign students to bring dependents in? Do you no. think if I was in charge, we'd have set you know the level know of... That when you, you know, when minimum you wage when levels you for When you break workers. down the migration figures, it's not just foreign students, it's also worker visas for shortages in the economy. Yes, yes. Uh, set, it's, it's Ukrainian refugees. at the level. But there's the a level. number of components no, no, no. in those net migration figures, some of which you need to pick... Set at the, the level fields. of minimum wage. That was not the promise. That was not the deal. So, we are where we are. Yeah. And when it comes to you and, and, and the Reform Party, of which you're the president... Yeah. Um, they did terribly in the local elections. So what does that tell you about your appealability now with the public? Well, they, I mean, they only fought five percent of seats, so it's very difficult to judge whether they did well or badly, to be honest. Um, and, you know, building up a national party political structure is not an easy thing to do. But I think the gap between Westminster and where people are is even bigger than it was ten years ago. I think there will be another insurgency in British politics. Uh, whether oh, it'll sorry. whether it'll be reform, whether it'll be me, whether we get a new Nick Griffin. People won't trust you. You made all these promises, and I don't. I, you know, I don't well, think. Do you'll you not find... think that you might be a busted flush well, on that? As I said to you, if you take the YouGov polling this week, of the 37% that are disappointed by Brexit, 75% of them lay it fairly and squarely at the doors of the Conservative Party. They're certainly not laying it at my door. I mean, and, and if it's not me and not reform, then maybe we get a Nick Griffin-type figure, maybe we get genuinely the far right into British politics. Something is going to change. This gap is too big. Do you genuinely think that you could come back now and run a campaign as the guy that's going to deliver a true, true Brexit, given what's passed? Oh, I think if I stood again, it would be a much more revolutionary agenda than just Brexit. It would be fundamental change to the voting system. Do you not think people might be watching this, people that listen to you mm -hmm. and what you promised in 2016 about how the country would change mm -hmm. after Brexit and what has come to pass and think, I don't trust a thing this guy I says think, no, to me? No, I think, I think they'll share my disappointment. OK, final question. Will I see you back in frontline politics then in the next five years? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. I haven't ruled it out. I haven't ruled it in. If I could see, by doing it, there was a really clear, achievable goal, then I might well. I haven't worked that out yet. If we had... If we had a form, uh, an electoral system, 
that was representative in some way, well, the answer would... And, th th then it would be much easier. And you, you, you brought Brexit to Britain in a way. You were the chief cheerleader. Now Brexit's in crisis. And your message to the British public is, it wasn't my fault. Absolutely. We've been let down very badly by an entirely dishonest establishment, globalist and, and now Remainer Tory party. And some voters might look at it and think you were dishonest when you were promising stuff that you could never deliver. Do you know what? I might have got things right. I might have got things wrong over my years in politics. I would like to think hand on heart I was never dishonest. OK. Nigel Farage, thank you so much. Thank you.